Welcome to the Law Father Podcast. I'm your co-host, Travis Scott Luther, with my other co-host, Lebahan Borgeson, and our tri-host uh, slash producer, Matthew Shrimplin. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so today's topic is uh, justice, and what is your staff's perception of the word justice? And I wonder how many of you have actually asked them Uh, We were talking a little bit off air and off camera, if you're watching on uh, YouTube or the Vimeos. Um, We were talking about the fact that uh, most uh, members of of a law firm are not actually attorneys. And so, um, and and obviously all members of my company are not attorneys, but we were talking about, this stemmed from the Darrow patch that I had made. And um, I actually have made this uh, after Trump had been elected, I don't know what possessed me to do it, but, um, Matt was like, what's up with the Darrow thing? Um, and my wife was like, what's up with the Darrow thing? Um, and, uh, so I thought I would take a second to explain that. And then what Leb said was, Hey, I went out and I researched Darrow and I thought, perfect. That's, that was what the point of that was, um, was that, uh, people might uh, see that and, and think, Oh, I'm going to go look Darrow up. But Darrow was a largely a criminal defense attorney out of Chicago, um, kind of an eccentric slob. If the two can it can exist together, you know, he probably was someone who um, moved and looked like Monk, uh, but was smart, probably like Sherlock Holmes or something like that. So I guess I guess that's what I would what I would say. Um, but uh, he he wrote a number of books. Um, uh, one was, uh, gosh, I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't called Crime and Punishment, but it was, uh, I don't, whatever it was, it was related to crime. I'm sure Leb can figure it out while I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but what I love about Daryl is that he believed that everybody had a right to def- to, to uh, the justice system, no, no matter how heinous their crime. Uh, he even represented two teenagers who had um, killed a boy uh, just to see if they could and just to see what it felt like. Um, to kill somebody, and he was an, an uh, ardent, uh, uh, um, I don't know, protester of the death penalty even in that time. And uh, I won't make any bones about the fact that I'm also an anti-death penalty. I don't think it's right to ever kill anybody, and I don't want to explain to my children when it's right to kill anybody. And I think if we get rid of the death penalty, then that conversation never has to happen. But I don't think we ever kill anybody, and I think that Darrow shared that sentiment. But what I like most about Darrow um, is I went to graduate school in sociology because um, just because I wanted to, which is a fortunate position for a lot of students who go to school because they feel like they have to. But I went to graduate school because I wanted to uh, learn about more about sociology. And um, Darrow believed that there were things outside of our own control that could influence our actions and that we had to be able to examine those critically. And, um, and think about their role in all sorts of stuff, crime included, but the rest of society. So I think he was kind of the, the first to say um, not that people shouldn't take personal responsibility, but that we also have to recognize what, what role society has to play in why people in, get involved in certain activity. So um, I thought that was important. Uh, when I made it, when I when I made the graphic design, because um, I want us all to remember that we have a role to play in what is about to happen uh, in our world, and to remember that, and to obey Darrow. <laughs> so, yeah. that I hope I hope that was clean and articulate. Um, but for Darrow, you know, on this topic of justice, I mean, you know, Darrow believed. Uh, wholeheartedly in access and I think that's why he defended some of the people he did even though they uh, had like I said committed heinous crimes Uh, he believed that the system was necessary and that those who had been accused had a right to it um, and also had a right to it to a defense and I don't know that that's how a lot of people feel today I certainly don't believe that that's how a lot of corporations feel today Um, and I just want to remind one I wanted people to go out and research a little bit about him and two, I wanted to remind people that uh, we we all have um, an effect on uh, each other, and let's be let's be mindful of that as we move into 2017 with our new president. Any comments from the? 
Well, I think the the book you were trying to remember was a crime, its cause and treatment. Ah, crime, its cause and treatment. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And, and I, I don't want to. I want to keep this relevant to law firms. And like I said, I want to get to. We're going to talk a little bit today about. Uh, I've I've been in the the business the longest, and and if you don't want to call the personal injury the the business, if that's offensive, I'm sorry, but a lot of people have have made it that, and, and we'll talk in la- later podcasts about problems associated with that. But you know, I've been here the longest, uh, and Leb, you've you've been here the second longest, and then Matthew over here is brand new, and so we're going to talk about how our perceptions of justice have changed. But um, going back to Darrow and that book. I don't mean to get overly personal and away from the law firm uh, issue, but you know I have two brothers, and I'm sure that they're they're younger brothers, and I'm sure they're fine with me telling them this. Because it's a public record anyway. But both of them have spent um, some chunks of time in prison, and they have spent some chunks of time in juvenile hall, and um, those have been very painful processes, uh, I'm sure for them, uh, but uh, you know for for our family as well and uh, you know for my mother and for myself so crime and uh, the causes of crime um, affect uh, not just the criminals but the people around them and I think when you look at the circumstances in which my brothers and myself grew up in and you look at what Darrow wrote in that book about how and why some people are motivated uh, to crime or end up in crime um, it really kind of spoke to me personally and it, it in a way, give you know, gave me a little bit of permission to, to uh, not blame my mother and to not blame my brothers entirely for uh, the way things turned out, you know. And again, like Darrow, I there, there, there's an aspect of personal responsibility that I think is important to keep important, if you will. Uh, but I think that there's also a level of forgiveness that has to come from that to say the circumstances in, in which caused, uh, motivated you to, uh, to do as you did, uh, may not be entirely, uh, your own fault. And, uh, and then that leaves me hopeful. That leaves me hopeful that you can, um, also, uh, be around people who have had challenges and, and that none of us are static. All of us are dynamic, meaning that I'm always changing. You're always changing. Um, we are always changing while we recognize it or not. And so I think that, that folks like my brothers, and they've certainly proved that at different points in their lives, also have the ability to take that positive influence that society can be responsible for um, and, and, and to do good. But they can't do that. <laughs> Don't mean to <laughs> continue on this. But they can't do that if we continue to hold these crimes against them, right? Either they, they do their time, and that is their punishment for their crime, and that when they get out, they're able to be assimilated, if you will, or go get jobs and stuff. But this garbage, this bullshit with the, the felony applications and, and stuff like that, I mean, I can appreciate it to a certain extent. Definitely, I, I don't want to hire anyone who has a violent felony, but I hate that it pre... That it, that it pre- uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, that it disqualifies so many people from employment and getting back to, to not where they need to be, but maybe even where they like to be. And so when we have these continued cycles of uh, criminality, and we go back and look at Darrow, we ask, well, what is our role to play? And when we put walls up in front of people who are trying to assimilate, uh, we 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 also bear some responsibility for why they they go back to prison. Does that make some sense? And it runs it it runs counter to you know the ideas that we at least you know try to um, honor as a country um, of you know you know do the crime pay the time um, you know if you the whole idea behind um, going to jail and um, and actually um, you know. You're paying for the crime that you did. You're um, you're you're trying to make amends, um, and supposedly, you know, you you hold up a liquor store or something, you go to jail for it. Then you're, you know, supposedly, at least on some level, it kind of washes the slate clean. But when people can't get jobs, when people when people can't move forward in their lives because of a mistake like that that supposedly has been paid for, um, it just continues the punishment, and it's not it's not it dishonors the whole the whole ideal that um, the system's based on right so 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 and if, so if you're a criminal defense attorney you know a lot of what I 
preach uh, publicly and privately is, uh, you know, we're in web development and you need you need those kind of messages on your site as well. You need to help educate the public about these problems and criminal defense attorneys are probably the ones in the best position to do that but to say hey i'm a criminal defense attorney and i also understand why my clients continue to have problems and to to be a public voice out there so that kind of gets us to to where we're going um and i think where we're going is what does justice what does the word justice mean to you and to think about the fact that in your own law firm uh, you pro- probably a majority of your staff, uh, you've never asked them that question. And uh, it might be interesting to know the answer. I think that uh, uh, the longer you've been doing this, the more evolved that definition has become. And I will say that this is a topic that kind of came off as a whim, so I don't have anything clearly defined that I want to talk about. But what I do want to talk about is at, the, at different levels within our our own company, how your perception of that has changed. And so um, I think it might be better to start with Matt, who, like I said, is, has been in our, our industry for two, two or three months now, and to just get uh, some thoughts on that from, from your perspective. Um, I mean, for, I think especially my perception of just the justice system has changed immensely. There's a lot of, um, I would say naive about it. I think I have this assumption that um, everything tends towards a, an, an end that is beneficial for everyone or that um, the generally it's a positive outcome what comes out of um, the justice system regardless if you're talking criminal cases or um, injury cases we deal with a lot. Um, but you really have to fight to uh, get somewhere where there actually is something just it's a very vague thing, and I'm still forming my thoughts on this because it's all very new to me. Um, but there's there's so much involved to um, keep that balance and to keep things actually just. There's uh, far more work and far more effort involved. It's way more delicate than I think I imagined it was. Mm. Del- delicate. I, I, I like that word. I like that word because you're right. There is so much more involved. And... Um, and justice doesn't just happen. I think my my own, before I met my wife and really understood how all of this worked, my own preconceived notion was that the law was pretty objective and um, there were rules. And uh, if I was uh, harmed by someone in a car accident or in a business dispute, and we didn't come to an agreement on our uh, on it ourselves, we would go to court and a judge would say, well, this is the law and this is what you get, Mr. Luther, and this is what you get, Mr. Smith, and uh, thank you for joining us. And I know that, uh, that that it's not objective like that at all. Even contracts are continually disputed on what terminology means. So, um, But you're right, and, and I like the word delicate because for me, it's um, what I have seen in my 10 years is sometimes a case can turn on the simplest little thing that no one ever thought of, you know, and, and it could be a technicality related to the, to the law, or it could be a perception, um, stuck inside your jury. And it's just, it is just so delicate in that sense for sure. So Leb, how about you? I mean, talk about, um, just talk about what, what you thought that the civil court system was or the criminal court system was before coming to work here and a little bit about how that's changed. You know, I think um, I thought along the same lines as Matt initially, um, you know, everything, uh, for the most part, you know, I figured we have a good system. It works. Um, it's just um, things end up the way they're they're supposed to end up. Um, Working, working trial support. Um, I think it's been probably about five trials at this point. Um, it's been really interesting to see how the sausage gets made, so to speak. Um, and it's and it's it's not it's not what you'd expect. It really is a fascinating process. It's it's one of my favorite things about this job. Um, so much um, depends on these, and I think delicate's a good word for it, um, subtle also um, nuances of the law that um, 
at not being an attorney um, and working trial, um, working jury um, trials and seeing um, jurors who aren't attorneys and seeing how, what the attorneys and the, the judges have to do to um, acknowledge those nuances, to not do something that, you know, is against um, the rules set up for that particular trial has been really interesting because there's a lot of there's a lot of little things and that you don't know about necessarily that um, especially you know just the working trial support but definitely for the juries um, that have to be taken into consideration. Um, give me give me a specific example. I mean, tell me about a time. Tell me about a time when you uh, were working trial support or you were working a trial, you know, doing trial support for us, and 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 you were like, shit that. That is not what I expected to find out when I came to court, when I when I came to a courtroom. You'd think, um, you know, you think back to the uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, I remember a trial um, that they had, um, and it was it was decided upon um, that uh, a prior injury wasn't. Um, there no information about a prior injury um, was to be taken into consideration for this particular. Um, this particular accident, this trial. Um, and seeing how um, the different sides, you know, one tries to, to push that boundary a little bit as far as possible, um, and the other side tries to push back. Um, you know, there was good reason um, in that case for um, that particular injury not to be brought up in this trial. Um, but it it was a jury trial, so you don't want to make the, the jury think like, oh, well, it's just a, it's just, it's just an extension of this prior injury, because mm -hmm. uh, it definitely wasn't. Um, but the the defense would try and, you know, uh, and push the line as far as they could to try and uh, just maybe get a little information out there about it. And then the uh, and then the um, the prosecutor would have to push back. And mm -hmm. um, that was really interesting because it isn't a it isn't a. Uh, uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth situation, you know, because yeah. you can unfairly bias a jury um, with 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 small things, with uh, just with with a, a single word, um, a single phrase, a single um, little fact that may or may not get uh, misrepresented can can throw the, the whole thing off. So it, it's a much finer um, process um, and a much more subtle and nuanced process than I, I had initially realized. Yeah. Um, and it, it can change the whole course of the trial. It can change the whole case. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it, it's fine. It's the witnesses who swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And then if your client gets up there, they have to do the same thing. But it's not. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a... It's a it's a cage match with uh, limited and predetermined weapons, um, yeah. And you 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 you're going in there um, with what uh, the the case has allowed you to go in there and fight with, whether that's orders from the judge or um, or laws about uh, uh, about trial conduct. Um, and and then when it gets interesting is to see how uh, the the attorneys are going to use those. Uh, those rules or tools, as I like to call them, to try and uh, make or break a case. I mean, that mm -hmm. that's fun. But I think, the, I think the misconception I had, one of the big misconceptions I had, was that you did have these law and order moments, if you will, uh, uh, that uh, there could be a surprise witness. You know, that like suddenly they would find somebody that you didn't know, that, oh, we didn't know that she was in the bushes watching this whole thing unfold, and now we're going to put her on the stand. You know, I, I thought that shit really happened. You know, I, I thought that you'd have surprise witnesses. I think one of the big revelations that came to me was that um, there are very few surprises uh, in trial. You know, that you're not, in a civil trial anyway, you're not going to have a, um, a surprise star witness you're not gonna no one is ever going to bust through those courtroom doors and make everyone go <gasps> ever it's not gonna happen i mean someone might get on the stand but you knew they were going to be there and they might say something you go oh, you know um but even then there you can you know that you're going to pull someone's deposition and and um and say well that's not exactly what you said when you were deposed so what's the what's the mm -hmm. truth here um T tell me, uh, Matt hasn't been in court yet. He's going to. Very excited about that. But um, let, I mean, let's think about why. What is it about your own, both of you, Matt and Lib, mm -hmm. your own perceptions of the justice system, and and that I understand what they are. How how is that helpful to me as a as a law firm owner, if you will, or a business owner? 
how is that why do I why do you think I need to know what you guys think about it um I mean I can speak to I think I didn't realize the variety of situations in which you're going to need a lawyer um and pretty much if you're going to deal with the legal system in any way at all you need to be doing that and it's a lot of effort there's a shocking amount of money involved but if you need to do it you need to find someone you can you can trust and has a lot of experience not just here's the other thing too is i think i was just like there's lawyers i, I don't think i understood um how specific uh, the, the knowledge of each lawyer is and mm -hmm. that the area of law that they've practiced in is very very important um if they actually have court experience that they're actually a trial lawyer um i, I don't think i realized uh, the extent of that as well. And I, I think a lot of people, if they've never had to deal with the justice system in that way, um, don't know what they even need to be seeking out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one thing, and, and Lev, I hope you have a comment too. I, I mean, but I, I think about a law firm, I think about like a new employee and you've never asked, uh, you've never asked him or her their perception of the justice system or haven't really like given them an opportunity to see how things work. And then you have somebody call and they're like, yeah, um, I was in a car wreck. I was stopped at a stop sign and someone ran in, got, you know, rear-ended me and um, they broke my back and they're like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Oh my gosh, that's like, that's a huge deal. Oh yeah, you're totally in the right. You should come in right away and we'll sign you up. I mean, that's like what you, you were in the hospital for a month. That's like a million dollar case, you know, come on in. You know, it just, it, it people the staff's perception is not leveled appropriately right so that so that when when clients or potential clients do come in that everyone is setting the same reasonable expectation right like we we used to write when we wrote this you know choosing uh, how to choose an attorney blog um you know is your attorney setting reasonable expectations and if if you and your staff don't all have the same or similar understandings or definitions of justice and don't understand that justice doesn't mean that everybody just gets what they want or just gets what they deserve, then you, you create the potential for lining yourself up, maybe even for a, a um, legal malpractice lawsuit where you because you've had three people tell someone their case is worth 10 million dollars and the lawyers say well <laughs> you know i mean you should have mentioned to us the fact that you were drunk and that um you had your cat in your lap and and etc etc because that's not a, actually a 10 million dollar case like i might be able to recover your bumper you know so <laughs> I, I think that's a, that's a reason it's important that you understand what your client what your staff believe the definition definition of justice is but I'd like you to chime in here now, Lab. Uh, the the initial question was, um, what? Why why I'm would saying? you? Why do you think it would be important that law that a law firm owner, the managing partner, actually take some time? Maybe at uh, from a previous podcast at one of those accountability meetings, actually take some time to ask each of his or her staff members, "What is your definition of justice?" Or give me an example of. Um, uh, you know, where you, not, I'm not asking you, but ask your staff. Give me an example of where you saw that, where you saw that definition be very successful, and where you saw it fail, just so that you kind of know where they sit on this. Well, I think it's important just for aligning your your goals as a firm too. Um, I think it's um, especially with something that's um, as important um, as as so many of these cases often are. Um, Knowing where everybody that everybody's fighting for for common cause, I think is is important, and understanding common cause, um, knowing it's essentially the same thing as a as a mission statement. You know, making sure everybody's on board mission statement, um, and everybody's working towards the same ends. Um, so, from a, just a perspective of uh, from that end, I think that's really important. Um, and then, like you pointed out, I think you know, making sure people know they making sure they're clear on what they're able to say um, to potential clients, um, what could possibly be problematic, things to, to look out for. Um, just gauging the general um, literacy, you know, legal literacy of your, of your staff, I think is very important, especially when the, the, the front lines for interacting with, um, with the public. Yeah, man, I, I really liked what you said about, um, everyone's definition of justice um, being in line almost like a mission statement. I mean, it, re it really made me think right there, 
maybe that's got to be another priority too is that the um that your law firm has a mission statement it has core values and it acts in accordance with those core values to accomplish its mission but that it also have a shared definition of justice because mm-hmm. I, I think that none of us have the same definition because none of us have the same experience and um I think you're absolutely right. When your employees generally are on the front line or they tend to be the people who deal with the clients the most, making sure that they ha- that they share your definition of justice helps ensure that they don't set unreasonable expectations. And I think mm-hmm. one thing we can all agree on is that the justice system for us is not what we thought it was when we started mm-hmm. this company or when we started working at this company. And you cannot make an assumption as the managing partner of a law firm that everybody who walks through that door as a potential client shares your definition of justice after five years, 10 years, 15 years. And so you better make sure that those expectations or that understanding is set with your employees, not not just to protect yourself, but going back to the previous podcast on the 80-20 rule as well, so that that 20% of uh, your clients who can be the problem, you know, who need to know a lot of stuff, that you that they know right away that this is not some kind of form that we fill out, we put it over there, the judge looks at it, makes a decision, then you get a check, right? Yeah. To prepare them to say, this isn't uh, where you take a deposition and no one asks you an uncomfortable question about some drugs you may have used when you were 16, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I've been in uh, many depositions, you know, one of the luxuries of this business, as I cross my legs and get all important, but um, of, of having to of having to build the business myself is that I've had to do almost all the work. I had to spend many years doing all the work for myself. And I can tell you that in depositions, people are asked all sorts of questions that have nothing to do with why you're there. If you're a woman who has been in a car accident and you have a herniated disc in your neck, why in the hell does anyone need your gynecological records? Or to ask yeah. you about them or to ask you about uh, mental health issues, or a time in college when you went and uh, visited with a suicide counselor. You know, I, it's like you, your, your, your clients and your staff also have to know that those are possibilities and to be prepared for things that do not feel like fucking justice, right? Mm-hmm. That does not feel like justice, right? That feels like injustice, the opposite of mm-hmm. justice. And that, that goes back to the, you know, how nuanced, um, you know, trials can often be. And, like, they're, they'll look for something. They'll try and find something that, you know, they can use to, you know, color your character a certain way. And, um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. But uh, you better be aware of it because it's, it's going to be there. Yeah. And I like that word fair. I mean, I like, I like these things that you're streaming together. A shared definition of justice. A shared, maybe even a shared definition of fair. But gosh, um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that your staff uh, has to know is that um, that most of these clients that you're going to be dealing with are going to feel like things are not fair, right? Mm-hmm. And what are you going to do when a, a client of yours calls mad or leaves a deposition uh, because they didn't think it was fair? How are you going to prepare them for that if they don't understand uh, if they don't understand what your definition of justice is, I I, I don't want to speak for my wife, but I would say for some for some attorneys, the definition of justice, right, um, is just being able to get somebody something, mm-hmm. right, something they couldn't get on their own, and if we just get them something, well then, we've done a great justice, but that, mm-hmm. but but that's 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 we know that's not justice sometimes that's, yeah that's budget constraints or bad yeah. bad facts or uh unruly client or low policy limits or all sorts of things and so um again i, I just i like that word of fairness and i like that word of a shared a shared uh definition of justice within a law firm and maybe we'll maybe we'll even think about that here i think i think uh we should lead by example and i think definitely I think you need a, a profound empathy for people who are entering into the justice system um, not knowing what they're getting into because it's it's going to be pretty tough and it's that's what the people on the front lines of uh, communicating with these clients are going to need is um, understanding what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, empathy. 
Yeah, you, I mean, you have to be empathetic, but I think you you have to per- use that empathy to prepare them mm-hmm. for what's about to happen. So, and and then again, get everybody on board with what what does that look like, and um, and how how can we how can we be that? Well, I think unless you guys have any closing comments, I think that kind of wraps up our podcast. Uh, anything matter, Lab? Well. Um... One last thing, I mean, you're, you know, your law firm's a team, and like any other team, um, you know, if you have a, a shared sense of purpose, it's going to be, um, you're going to be able to meet your goals better. Yeah. So I think just, I just want to put that in there about that. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, I think that's great. I think everybody on a basketball team knows that the goal is to dribble down the court and put that ball <laughs> in the net. And if you have confusion about that, you're going to lose a lot of games. So. No, I'm in total agreement. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I'm Travis Luther. My co-host has been Lebahan Borges, and our producer is Matthew Shrimplin. This is the Law Father Podcast. Uh, thanks for listening. Make sure to like us. Make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes. Make sure to leave some comments, ratings, stars, all of those things, and we will talk to you again next time.